Hi, welcome everybody. Thank you for being here today. My name is Katie Chukowski and I'm the Special Collections Librarian at Portsmouth, Portsmouth Public Library in New Hampshire. I use she, her pronouns and I am an Asian American woman with straight black hair. I'm wearing a white scarf with black geometric patterns and a black sweater and I'm in my office here at the library. Also joining us today is Nicole Luongo Cloutier, who is Head of Reference and Special Collections. We have Jennifer Schuer, a professional genealogist and one of our genealogy workshop coordinators, along with Tylene Juice, who is the registrar for the local ranger chapter of the DAR. And the DAR, or Daughters of the American Revolution, are our co-sponsors for these genealogy workshops, and we are very grateful for their help in bringing you these programs. And I'd like to begin today with our land acknowledgement. The city of Portsmouth is on the homelands of the Abenaki people who have ongoing cultural and spiritual connections to this area. According to tribal oral tradition, Abenaki people have lived in the place now called New Hampshire for more than 12,000 years, since before tribal memory. The Abenaki are part of a larger group of indigenous people who call themselves Wabanaki, or people of the dawn, and form one of many communities connected by a common language family. Here at the Portsmouth Public Library, we are committed to acknowledging and honoring the human history tied to this land. So today's event will last until 4 p.m. and we plan to be respectful of your time. We have turned on subtitles for the event for greater accessibility, but if you'd prefer not to see them, you can, uh, you can select hide subtitle as an option at the bottom of your Zoom window. And we're recording today's event and that video will be available on our YouTube channel in a couple of days. And you're welcome to leave your video on or turn it off, but we ask that you keep yourselves muted during Teresa's talk. And if you have any questions during the talk, you can put those in the chat and I'll read them to Teresa at the end of her presentation, or you can save your questions until the end and ask them out loud. We have a couple of upcoming programs that I wanna tell you about before we begin. And the first is this Tuesday, February 22nd, when we'll be hosting Sandra Rux, formerly of the Warner House, Wentworth Gardner and Lear Houses and the Portsmouth Athenaeum. She'll be joining us on Zoom from 7 to 8.30 p.m. to present a local history talk about the demolished Lieutenant Governor John Wentworth House by examining the lives of five women, all named Sarah, who occupied the house. And this talk will require registration and I'll share that link in the chat. We also have a lot of other great local history talks lined up for 2022. We host one a month and in March, we'll be hosting Nur Shoop from the Black Heritage Trail. We'll talk about the history of green books on the seacoast. And then in April, we'll be hosting Will Brassard Broussard from the Mount Washington Observatory, and he'll talk about the year New Hampshire experienced snow and frost all summer long, and that became known as the year without a summer. So stay tuned and keep an eye on the calendar as those events will be added. And we love hearing from you about what you'd like to see at the library, so I'll share an online event feedback form in the chat. If you fill it out, you'll not only help the library, but you'll also be entered to win a library book bag. And this contest is only open to those who can visit the library and pick up the prize. So sorry to those of you in North Carolina and Washington State. Um, thank you all again for joining us today. As many of you know, Portsmouth is going to be celebrating our 400th anniversary next year in 2023. And as I stated earlier, we here at the library are committed to acknowledging the human history tied to this land. And that includes the history of those who get overlooked or whose history is only told when it's convenient. So we hope that today's talk will enlighten us about the early Black presence in New England and help us to find ways to honor the Black community that has called Portsmouth home. So let's get to it. Let me introduce today's speaker, Teresa Vega, to you all. Teresa earned degrees in anthropology and Asian studies from Bowdoin College and worked as an adjunct professor in cultural anthropology while, at while attending City University of New York Graduate School and University Center's doctoral program in anthropology. She has used her background in cultural mm -hmm. anthropology to help research her ancestral roots. Teresa uses her blog to share her genealogy research on both her maternal mixed race African-American side, as well as her, her Puerto Rican paternal side. <laughs> Teresa is a proud member of the New Jersey and New York chapters of the Afro-American Historical and Genealogical Society and is a Black Pro-Gen Live panelist. She has also served as co-administrator of Family Tree DNA's Malagasy Roots Project, along with Cece Moore of PBS's Finding Your Roots and DNA Detectives since 2014. And I will share her uh, blog website um, and her social media handle in the chat as well. And with that, Teresa, I will turn it over to you. Okay, I am uh, happy to be here and I want to give honor to uh, my ancestors 
for allowing me to tell their story. And I also want to thank the Portsmouth Public Library as well as the DAR for inviting me today to, to speak. I have no problem repping my ancestors 24 seven. Um, one of the things uh, I wanna discuss today is the changing of the borders. Um, when you look at, I'm sorry, I have to uh, move this thing down. Uh, when, you dis when you discuss Greenwich, uh, you definitely have to look at the border issue. Greenwich, when you go back to the 1600s, it was part of New Amsterdam. It was part of, if it's part of New Amsterdam, it's coming out of New York. And throughout, up until the 1830s, it was also known as Byram, Saw Pits, East Port Chester, and Rye, New York. If you look at Greenwich today, the borders, you are going to miss the whole story of what happened. Uh, during these time periods because you have overlapping territories. So I want people to be cognizant of that, that when they are discussing Greenwich or researching Greenwich, you can't do that in isolation. You have to look at Westchester, uh, even New York City, because people were moving uh, between these areas. Uh, these locations, again, are very much linked to New York and New Amsterdam. And in Greenwich, your first enslaved people were actually Native Americans, followed by the forcible importation of people of African descent. And these people came from not only West Africa, but also East Africa, as well as, as, well as South and Central America. And that is key. When we look at um, just history, Historic context matters, and it's it's very important that we um, realize that um, individuals, when you're discussing history, have to be analyzed within the specific time period in which they lived. No one is responsible for the acts of their ancestors. People live complex, often contradictory. Uh, multi-dimensional lives, and no one living today can with 100% certainty account for all the words and actions of their ancestors. And history must encompass the voices and lived experiences of everyone involved. And I say this because we're in such a critical time period where um, the flavor of the month seems to be critical race theory, I don't deal with any theory. I deal with facts. I deal with documentation. This happened. History happened. We can't change it. So we need to analyze it from all perspectives and maybe this nation will be better for it. My story begins um, a long time ago. I do research. Uh, uh, I've been doing research for over 20 years. I've been doing it intensively with my uh, third cousin, Andrea, also a descendant of Georgie Green and Laura Thompson um, for the past 13 years or so. However, I had this wonderful book that I got in the mid 1990s by my friend and mentor, Jeffrey Binghamid, who's you see with me right there. He wrote the book, Chains Unbound, Slave Emancipations in the Town of Greenwich. And it's a fundamental book. And I'm happy to say that uh, FamilySearch.org has uh, this book in their collection. So anyone can access this book and, um, and find out the names and uh, of the people involved. One thing about Greenwich is if you look, this is the 1790 census. As you can see, uh, most enslavers had uh, only one to two um, enslaved people working for them. Your, the highest amount 
of enslaved people are associated with the Houston and the Bush families. And we'll get back to them. Uh, but if you look at uh, Nathan Merritt Jr. has three, that is my fourth great grandmother Peg and her two sons. Uh, one is Charles Merritt, the other one is uh, Jack Houston. He took the Houston name. And then if you look over to, um, I believe, where is my greens? Uh, John Green, you see one. That is my fourth great grandfather, Anthony. When you look at Hangroot, Hangroot was a much larger geographical uh, area in Greenwich that over time becomes um, sort of con constricted to Round Hill Road, and we'll discuss why. But the northern border, I had to come to, to find it, uh, is Clapboard Ridge. Your western border would be Pexlin Road. The eastern border would be Lake Avenue. And on Lake Avenue, you had the Bethel AME Church. And then the southern border would have been um, Glenville Ave. And the reason why I, most of your people of African and Native descent live within uh, that larger uh, uh, geography, geographical area. Now, when you talk about Hangroot, there's certain facts and that the enslavement of indigenous and African people happened in the mid 1600s. Prior to the 1820 census, the following surnames were given to African and native people, Negro, Indian, and African. Hangroot was actually an integrated community from the beginning. The population fluctuated um, between 80 individuals in the 1790 census to a high of 182 by the mid 1800s. And then there's a, a steep decline as we head towards 1900. A majority of Hangroot residents were farmers, laborers, stonemasons, coachmen, servants, domestics. And most enslaved people took the name, the surname of their former enslavers. And the community, uh, it's funny because when we talk about any colonial family, uh, whether you're a descendant of Jamestown, descendant of the Mayflowers, people take for granted that uh, somehow Europeans, because they're colonial families and because they came from uh, uh, such a small group of people initially, they have all these descendants and it's taken for granted that everybody knows endogamy happened, but people do not really talk about the amount of endogamy that happened between these early African and, and native communities. And that's one of the things that um, we will see today. So when we go back to facts, one of the things that we have is because again, you know, uh, Byram was part of Rye and part of Greenwich. We have documents that are associated with the Greenwich Historical Society and others that are associated with the Rye Historical Society. And I do sit on the board of the Rye Historical Society. So my fourth great grandmother's bill of sale at the age of 20 uh, to Nathan Merritt Jr. was, she was sold for 50 pounds of New York money. And you can see the corresponding amount of her value today a little over a thousand dollars. So imagine um, had she been and not emancipated in 1800, um, you know, they, they got a lot of good work out of her for her money and, and also a lot of work out of her children. We have the 1796 bill of sale for Jack to Simeon Lyon at the age of three for 15 pounds of New York money. That is almost $300 today. Uh, in the handout that you will be getting, I have a blog post where um, I wrote a blog called Coming to the Table in Honor of uh, Jack Houston, 
and I tell the story of what happened to Jack after Simeon Lyon passed away. And um, with my Lyon cousin, Julie Pollock, who was one of the uh, people um, who defended our colored cemetery in court, uh, uh, we were able to tell Jack's story completely. So, um, and he was bought by Simeon Lyon in a nutshell because Simeon and his wife were childless. Um, we have the 1800 Emancipation Record for Peg at the Greenwich Historical Society. We have the 1812 Letter of Indenture for Henry Green, her youngest son, to Nathan Merritt Sr. at the Rye Historical Society. And then we have the 1816 Emancipation Record for Anthony, uh, which was found in Captain John Green's um, will. Um, and he willed Anthony to his wife um, and, and for $100. Now, I want to say that our names, Lion Green Merritt. Um, Peg was a lion before she had, uh, was, was sold to uh, Nathan Merritt Jr. Nathan Merritt Jr. was the nephew of Captain John Green. His mother was a green. And um, she had two children, Charles and Jack, who were fathered by uh, Nathan Merritt Jr. And we know via DNA that, that we are related to those merits. And then she marries my uh, fourth great grandfather, Anthony, and she has five other sons as well. I show this slide uh, because the first arrow points to the value of Anthony in um, Captain John Green's will, $100. That's the top picture and the arrow. You might not be able to see it, but trust me, he's $100. And in that same will, that is the equivalent of his bedding. So a human being was the equivalent amount of bedding. I want you to think about that. Um, it's something to be seen and digested. Um, this is the bill of sale for uh, uh, Jack that the Greenwich Historical Society has. Um, and that's a lot. You know, he uh, and, and Nathan Merritt Jr. Um, is selling to Simeon Lyon. So, and yeah, for 15 pounds of New York money. And I don't know if people realize that, that right after the Revolutionary War, um, certain states were printing their own money and New York was one of them. Now, this is my cousin, Pat, who might be in the chat room. And that's Sherry Jordan, the director of the Rye Historical Society, uh, holding Peg's bill of sale for Peg. And that was taken a couple of years ago uh, when we went to visit uh, and see the documents there. Now, um, one of the things I want to discuss is we've recently found this record where Anthony ran away. And there's a lot that's in a runaway ad. We were shocked to find this. Um, we always felt that um, Anthony was mixed race because he was afforded a lot of privileges, which I talk about in various blog posts, um, that other people did not have. But when we saw that he ran away, there were certain things that stuck out. One, um, that John Green placed the ad and that was in November 22nd, 1811. So you got to consider that we're on the verge of the War of 1812. We do know that, that Peg and Anthony had to give up their son, Henry, uh, to, to, uh, to be indentured until the terms of his gradual emancipation um, were fulfilled. And so there was a lot going on. But um, the amount of money for the person who found him was $10.
he's described as yellowish. Now, yellow is one of these categories that can mean colored. Colored could mean um, not only black and white, it could be triracial, which our family is. It could be native and white. And it can also, it's also a descriptor for um, people who were from Madagascar. He says, the ad says he's 5'7", 36 years, 36 years old, so born circa 1775. Um, I believe that to be true because the Greens were short. The Thompsons were tall. My granddad was Richard Warren Green Jr. I think he was 5'7", max. If you go back and you look at all the um, Civil War records for our Connecticut um, 29th Infantry Colored Troop uh, ancestors, they were all like 4'11", 5'2", short. So that's true. But what was interesting was it said he was wearing a brown coat and bearskin trousers. Bearskin trousers were just a rough homespun um, cotton that Peg probably made for him. But yet he stole a new brown coat and black velvet pantaloons. But the most interesting thing is he had his toe cut off. Now, we know when um, that there were slave codes put into effect um, by the early 1700s that prescribed the treatment of both free and enslaved people of color. We do know that there were slave codes that discussed um, what would happen to people who ran away and uh, amputations is one of those things that um, is mentioned. So do we know if he ran away before and he was like, got his toe cut off? Was it a farming accident? We don't know, but it's interesting to know and to see that it could have been that. But we know he came back. So this picture here is uh, on the right is Georgie Green, my second great grandfather. He's classified as in him and his ancestors or relatives are classified as mulatto, black, sometimes white, sometimes uh, Indian, and sometimes most often free people of color or colored. Um, he married Laura Louise Thompson from Newark. And Laura Louise comes from another uh, mixed race family, triracial family. Um, her mother was also fathered by an enslaver. And her father was also mixed race. But when the two of them got together, what you see is the unification of two early Black abolitionist families. Before I go on, I have to follow Laura's line because um, we had a major breakthrough. I kid you not, two Decembers ago, we found Anthony's runaway slave ad and Toons, my fourth great grandmother, Laura Louise's grandmother's runaway slave ad that had even more nuggets for her. And since uh, this talk is co-sponsored by DAR, um, it was this ad that first mentioned my fifth great grandfather, who I will be uh, pursuing my DAR membership under Samuel Green. But it mentions that Jeremiah Burroughs uh, placed this ad on January 9th, 1815. He was a merchant. He was a salt and flour merchant on Cherry Street, right down in the south street seaport. He ended up, um, actually, he would travel up and down the coast, the east coast, going to Boston, Charleston, whatever, exchanging salt and flour for various goods, which he would then sell not only in the Caribbean, but also in Africa, also going over to Liverpool, where he had relatives as well. So he was very much uh, a merchant who was actively involved in the transatlantic slave trade. 
Toon was 19 years old when this ad was placed. She had run away the, the summer before. And it says she had a 10-month-old uh, son named John Green, who was named after a person she considered to be her husband, also named John Green, who was a sailor, um, not only in South Street Seaport area, but he was from the Tappan Patton. And the Tappan Patton today uh, covers uh, part of Virgin County and Rockland County. It's, it's where uh, her relatives um, resided, which is in the Ramapo area. Um, I love this ad because she says her husband. So she's exercising agency saying that this is a man who she chose to be her husband. We know this is probably her first husband. Her second husband um, was Pompey Snyder. But the ad mentions that her father was a man named Freeman, and he had a chimney business. He was actually a master chimney sweep, and he shared a home with Henry Webb, a grocer on Reed Street, which is in Tribeca, and that she had a sister who was basically manning Henry Webb's store. Now, um, and going back to, and, and we and mentioned in the ad that uh, she was previously owned by Anna Marie Maybe, um, and that Maybe family is connected to uh, some of the original founders of the Tap and Patton, which is the Blog Velt, Herring Schmidt, which Schmidt morphs into Smith families of the Tap and Patton, and they actually connect to other, our other Afro. Dutch or our, I, I'd say, yeah, Afro-Dutch ancestors who migrated from New Amsterdam in 1678 to the Tappan Patton. So uh, once I had that, I was able to look at the 1800 census in Orange, New York, and we could see Samuel and his wife was living, they were only living a few doors down from her. By 1800, they have homes in both New York City and in Orange. So a couple of years ago, uh, right before we found out about the Colored Cemetery, I wrote this blog post, a look at Northern Slavery Personified, the Greens and Merits of Greenwich. Prior to me writing this blog post, no one knew that the Greens and the Merits were one family. So again, as I said before, Peg and Anthony, Peg had uh, uh, a bunch of sons. Um, you have Charles Merritt, all sons, Jack Houston, and then with my fourth great grandfather, she had Anthony Green Jr., Platt, Allen, Henry, and Solomon. And under gradual emancipation, all of her children were freed between 1816 and 1831. And the, the Lion Greens and Merritts are listed um, as free Blacks in the 1800 census. Um, and under Anthony Negro, <laughs> and possibly uh, they're listed in 1800 um, as free Blacks when Peg was freed. Now, Anthony uh, Green was included by 1820 in a $5,000 land deal that moved the family from uh, Byram to Hang Root Proper, which is Round Hill Road. Uh, the Lion Green Merits, you know, became farmers who owned their own land. Uh, their children were farmhands and, and servants or, or workers to the descendants of their former slave uh, holding families. And the Thompson Lion family has over 250 plus year relationship with our Lion Greens and Merits. There's a reason why we have a colored cemetery. There's a reason why in 1890, the um, Lion family stood up and defended our cemetery the first time it was desecrated. Um, Peg died circa 1830, Anthony around 1836. And in his will, he leaves um, his property to his children. In 1845, 
1830, my third great grandfather, Alan Green, was living in Rye, New York. Um, and in 1845, he built uh, the Green Twachman House that today is um, associated more with uh, John Twachman, um, a very uh, great, good painter who bought the property. However, let it be known, you heard it from me, that the it's the Green Twachman House, and it's the house that Alan built. And, and I say that because sometimes that's forgotten, uh, and the focus is always on John Twachman when it was a house that Alan built. By, um, as you can see, when we, we get to, um, you know, why cemeteries matter is that the Lion Green Merits were members of the Second Congregational Church in the 1840s and are buried in Lot 23 of Union Cemetery in Greenwich. Uh, they were also founding members of the Colored Mission of the Stanwich Church. And let it be known that um, the Colored Mission of the Stanwich Church is actually um, the precursor to the AME, the Beth, Little Bethel AME Church, which is a landmark church in Greenwich that our ancestors founded. Prior to uh, the founding of Little Bethel, um, Thomas uh, Green, my second great grandfather's brother, Thomas, was actually um, a minister. And when he married Emmeline Peterson, her, her, her family were, were founding members of the Colored Mission. He joined that church, as did his sister, Sarah. And later, Alan became a deacon, and there were times when that colored mission was basically in Alan's house, uh, as well as they were having meetings in the bush outside that Thomas was um, officiating. Our extended family is also buried in the historic African American Cemetery in Rye, New York. Uh, our Hetty family are in the Hetty Burial Ground, which borders Austin and Yorktown and Newcastle, New York. There are also several other cemeteries um, in the Hills region of, of Harrison. Also, you cross over to New Jersey, uh, you'll find our members there. Many served in the United States Colored Troops, especially the 29th uh, Infantry, the 100th Infantry out of New York, and the famous 54 regiments from Boston during the Civil War, as well as the uh, 15th Regiment um, in New York. And I have to say it, we always served on the right side of history. We were patriots through and through. And in Little, in Little Bethel AME Church, as I said, was founded in 1882. It's the first African-American church in Greenwich, and our ancestors were among the founders, as were members of the Bush family and other Black Greenwich family. Um, I've written a blog post on Hangroot, and, and let me clarify here when I talk about Black Greenwich. I'm talking about the folks who were always in Connecticut, in Greenwich, in Porchester, from the beginning. I'm, I'm excluding all those people who migrated north after the Civil War. Uh, not that they don't matter, but these are the founding members of Hangru. In this picture, which is thankfully the Greenwich Historical Society gave to me, up at the top right here, you can hardly see it, this picture was taken right when um, John Twachman bought the property at 30 Round Hill Road. Um, and then this is, I believe, Solomon's house or Alan's house. But uh, when I saw this picture and after reading several accounts of John Twachman, I wrote about this in my blog as well, um, and Hangroot is... You know, one of the things about doing research on enslaved and formerly enslaved ancestors is that not only do we have to read between the lines, 
we're often reading very derogatory information. So you, you, I've read these articles where um, Jonathan Twachman and various writers are saying, oh, when he bought the property, he had to beautify the property. He had to do all of this. It was ugly. They didn't, you know, you yada, yada, yada. And I remember when I presented uh, at a uh, talk at the uh, Bellhaven Yacht Club with the Greenwich Historical Society. And um, one of the things I, I forgot to mention is another, I love my fun facts. Uh, Allen's house that Allen built was bought in the late 60s by um, Jim Henson of the Muppets. So here I am on the panel. Uh, we have the moderator. Uh, you have myself. You have uh, uh, Cheryl Henson, you have a, hi a historian about John Twachman, and I'm blanking on her name, I apologize, and then you have John Nelson, the current owner of the Green Twachman House, and one of the questions was, well, what does the house mean to you, Teresa? And I had to chuckle and say, well, when you consider that one generation one generation from out of slavery that my ancestor could even buy a house that well you know i started singing we moved up to the east side we finally got a piece of the pie because that's exactly how i felt it meant success i don't care how other people described it for us as descendants of enslaved people this was success. Uh, they were able to prosper. And I've said it before, they crawled down that long path to emancipation. Peg and Anthony stood up so that their children could walk. So some of us are flying today. And I give honor to them because they were survivors of slavery and they prospered. This, now we can get to the pictures. Um, these pictures up at the top, um, you see Chris here. Okay, these are, these are my, my cousin, Pat. Uh, we go everywhere together. Both of these folks were included in um, the court case. And um, this is Chris and this is Cheryl Nelson and Pat. Uh, and this is, that's Cheryl Henson, sorry. And then the middle picture is John Nelson. He actually uh, gives tours and he has maintained, uh, tries to maintain the gardens that uh, John Twachman have. And in the lower right is a picture of the Green Twachman house of yesteryear. Um, this is a house that already has, is a historic home. If we can get it on the Freedom Trail, I'm trying. Um, but one of the things I'd like to say is, um, you know, this place matters. These are only some of the lion green merits. And as I said in the chat uh, and in the audience today, we just found new cousins from Darius Green as well as Georgie Green. So uh, uh, we live on and um, we might have been not, we don't live in Greenwich proper, but we're all around and uh, we're all here. So let me start talking about the other people that existed in Hangroot. And um, one is Hardy Indian. And I have a source document uh, PDF that I'm gonna be sharing uh, that has all the sources. So one of the things I wanna point out here is that Hardy Indian is considered the last Indian, quote unquote, in Greenwich, and he died around 1860. However, he's a possible descendant of ja John Howdy, which we think Hardy Indian comes from, uh, who fought in the French and Indian War between uh, 1755 and 1762. Uh, he's possibly a grandfather. There is a John Indian listed in the 1820 Greenwich census with one other person who we believe to be Hardy, and he worked for the Houston family. However, when you read this article, and I didn't blow up, um, 
And I, I have to give a shout out to my cousin, Chris Varner, because um, her ancestor, uh, I think second great grandfather um, was the employer of Hardy Indian. But in this article, there's a picture. If you remember that picture with my merit ancestors looking down the brook, that's Horseneck Brook. That's right behind where the Green Twachman House would be. And in this article, it talks about how Hardy Indian would be a Native American garb and all the kids would run away and he would scare them. And um, the writer talks about how he lived in a cave in, 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 in the Brook area when in fact, Chris provided her oral history that he lived on her um, second great grandfather's uh, property in a barn that when he got sick, they called a doctor. And then she had this fabulous story that, um, you know, prior to him passing away, her grandfather uh, dressed him up in a suit and tie and took him to Greenwich and had a photograph taken, which they later gave to the Bruce Museum in Greenwich. And it turns out the Bruce Museum sold, I guess, sold off a lot of their Native American artifacts. Um, she still has, um, I believe, and she's in the chat, so she can correct me later, but she still has, uh, uh, I think, a pipe that he made and maybe another item. But when you read the article, again, it's, it's one of these noble savage type um, uh, uh, portrayals of hardy Indian that maybe he's primitive or whatever, but you don't get the full story. So you have to be cognizant that when you are reading articles, um, you have to read between the lines. One of the things people don't know about is that uh, Rye Playland was actually a burial ground, an indigenous burial ground. Um, and it's something to remember that, again, this was native land before settlers moved here. So we can look at contemporary newspapers, I, I should say to this one, in the, in the 16, late 1600s, 1700s, early 1800s, where you still have indigenous people around. And whether they're Mohawk, Lenape, uh, members of the Wappinger Federation, like Hardy Indian, um, Pequot, you know, there's still people around during this time period after the revolution. Uh, and it's their land that is taken over and becomes a playland. So when you go to Rye Playland, remember that. That's again, native land. This picture comes from the Greenwich Historical Society. The top arrow is, uh, of course, Caleb Houston. This is Samuel Merritt. And Samuel Merritt is Charles Merritt's son. And my cousin, Pat, who's probably in the chat room, it's her ancestor. And as you can see, this is a house that Alan built right here. As you get closer to the, I should say, well, to talk, it's a later slide, but as you get closer to the 1880s, all of this property that surrounds the Green Twachman House is bought up by the Rockefellers. So nothing says gentrification like the Rockefellers. Another individual that lived uh, during this time period is Peter John Lee. He becomes famous. Uh, he arrived in Greenwich sir, around the time that um, my third great grandmother, Alan's wife, Mary Johnson, arrived, which is in the late 1820s. Alan and Mary were buried in second, buried, listen to me, married in second congregational church in 1828. It's also around the time period that you have my Carter Lee cousin, William Grimes, walking through Greenwich, and he eventually ends up. Um, in New Haven. Uh, but what you have is Peter John Green. He was a free Black who worked for Seth Lyon 
and Gilbert Lyon. They were advocates, his advocates. Um, uh, Seth was a, a lawyer and Gilbert was a merchant. Um, they lived around the, I believe in the green, uh, I'm sorry, the Thomas J. Lyon house. And if you're familiar with that area, the Thomas J. Lyon house is on the border. We're talking about Byron Bridge is not even, doesn't even take you five minutes to walk over it, but it separates New York from Connecticut. Again, borders. Peter John Lee was enticed by another black person to go over the Byron Bridge where he was kidnapped by the infamous kidnapping club. And um, he was then transported back and re-enslaved in Virginia. He escaped the second time with the help of a man that I wish I could go back in time and talk to, David Ruggles. Um, he eventually escapes a second time, ends up in Canada where the trail is lost. But Seth and Gilbert advocated tremendously to get him back to no avail. And thanks to uh, my cousin, Julie, um, her family still has artifacts that they're holding in storage. Hopefully when the Thomas J. Lyon house gets completely renovated, uh, some of these artifacts will find their way back. But this is what they listed as the slave table, the table that either um, Jack or uh, Peter John Lee. By the way, Jack Houston lived right across the street from the Thomas J. Lyon house on a property that no longer exists. So when you consider the geographical location to where Simeon Lyon's house was, which was very close, like across the street, uh, it makes you think how close your ancestors could have been, especially after the Fugitive Slave Act of 1850 to be in re-enslaved. The kidnapping of free Blacks was a real concrete fear because it happened. Um, this is one of the five places that matter. Again, it's the Thomas J. Lyon house and I'm with my crew. And up in the upper right, this is um, Josephine Conboy. Uh, she is the, the director of the Greenwich Preservation Trust. And I always tell this story and I laugh at that picture because um, when I first, this is an unrenovated house. I live in Northern Manhattan, 10 streets up from me is um, the Dykeman Farmhouse. So when the desecration of the cemetery happened, I was like, oh my God, I have to reach out and follow. I, until that time, I was hesitant to add our lion ancestors to my tree. And then I was like, okay, I have to do this. So I called... I dialed up and I saw that there was a phone number associated with the Thomas J. Lyon house. And I tell this story because people cannot tell me that my ancestors have not chosen me to tell my story. And I, I called up uh, and I just, I said, hello, uh, um, I'm trying to find out the genealogy of Daniel Lyon. And I'm talking to Joe. And finally she says, who am I talking to? And I said, oh, God, I was so rude. Um, my name is Teresa Vega. All I hear, heard was screaming, you're the one we've been waiting for. And I said, really? And then she told me the true story about the desecration. She told me how um, it was the members of the Greenwich Preservation Trust, a lot of them, most of them descendants of the Lyon family, who when they saw the, it happened to be an unpaid volunteer sailing by, kayaking by, who saw the desecration, who sounded the alarm. And they were just waiting for one of us colored folks to show up. And so uh, from there, everything um, happened. But in this, right below that picture is the attic where we believe that our ancestors may have slept. But when I had this tour, I walked out of there and I looked at her and I was with um, 
uh, Eric, uh, who was also a, a member of the Greenwich Preservation Trust and on the Conservation Committee. And I, I turned, Eric Brower, and I, I turned around to Shell. And I said, Shell, you can't tell me they weren't doing underground railroad work. You have Peter John Lee, they had boats. They were taking, they were, not only did they sell produce, up and down the Hudson River all the way, but they also uh, sold um, uh, Byram, I believe, stone from that built the Brooklyn Naval Yard. And so I walked out of there. I was like, Joe, they had to be do something. She's like, Teresa, no one asked these questions before. I said, bet. I bet you they were doing something. So when you read um, the blog post coming to the table in honor of Jack, you'll find out what happened. So yes, of course. Uh, we later found out that Seth and Gilbert um, were members of uh, the Whig Party, the precursors to the old Republican Party, that they were in fact advocates, anti-slavery advocates, and they were joined by a third cousin, Benjamin uh, Lyon out of White Plains, who was also a Whig and anti-slavery. So whenever I see that picture, I have to smile because I'm like, bet, I won the bet show. Um, another individual again, Ali African. So you, you see a theme, Anthony Negro, Hardy Indian. Now we have Ali African, if you have no doubt where he was born. So he was born circa 1793 in Africa and he died in 1879. Um, Ali is probably A-L-I, uh, clearly a Muslim. And he was, we actually found a newspaper ad recently um, that, that stated explicitly that he was brought to Greenwich by James Lyon, who was actively involved in the transatlantic slave trade. So the article says um, when he died, he was remembered by a, a, a boy who was of a similar age who remembers that um, James Lyon brought him out. Now, uh, Graham Russell Hodges has a new revised version of the Book of Negroes. I encourage people to read it um, because in that particular uh, edition, uh, you clearly see that James Lyon, not only did James Lyon um, have several enslaved people who escaped and became Black loyalists who ended up in Nova Scotia, but you also had, I believe, a brother of David Bush of the Bush Holly House who had an enslaved person named Cuffy Bush um, who ended up a Black loyalist. So um, I believe I, I, I've told Dennis Culleton and also Heather Lodge, both of whom are um, working on the Witness Stones project out of memorializing um, the Bush family of the Bush Holly House, the enslaved Bush family of the Bush Holly House, that I believe that Cuff Bush is the father of Cole Bush. So that is a great resource. Um, he was married to Rachel. It does turn out that they had several children. He was enslaved in 1840. However, by 1850, he is the richest um, person of African descent in Greenwich. Uh, according to various newspaper articles, um, they called him Ali Mink. And it could be because he was, might have been a fur hunter and was traded mink. But, but again, you have to read between the lines. But what I find fascinating, and this is a sad story, is that um, him and Rachel, as they aged, became uh, unable to take care of themselves. A conservator was appointed to handle their affairs in 1878. He turned around again. Um, when you're talking about formerly free or free Blacks, one of the things you have to remember is um, if, you, you could, if you were a freed Black person, you could not be considered a ward of the town or a ward of the poorhouse or whatever. Um, a lot of times when you were emancipated, you, you know, either your former enslaver 
or you had to promise that you would not, you could take care of yourself. Um, they became old and elderly. Um, he took their land and put them in the poorhouse. And so that happened. Um, we came across this article where it said the far famed Ali Mink. Again, that name should be A L I Mink, probably associated with the fact that he was either a fur trader or a trapper. Uh, he's supposed to be over 100 years old, has finally, to use John Hayes' words, passed. Cat, uh, passed in his check. Ali was a colored man who resided at Hangroot and though decidedly eccentric, was much respected. Frequently, he was subjected to the jeers and taunts of the depraved and thoughtless, but still he always maintained the peaceful tenor of his ways, which gained for him many friends. So again, um, he was targeted and he was probably taunted and called whatever names, but he remained respectful. Um, when they talk about far famed, consider this. When you have other members of Hang Root, uh, be it our Green family or the Purdy family, these are people who, in the Bush family, people wonder what, you know, why we can't find descendants of the other early families of Black Greenwich, it's because people had to travel, not to be a ward of the town or be kicked out of the town. They had to travel, be separated from their families, not to be a burden to the town. So a lot of times what you have is people migrating down to the city or other parts of Connecticut over to Westchester, like my greens into New Jersey because they can't find work. Um, if you look further down that article, um, they talk about Alan after he died, his house was sold. Um, and he died in 1878. Again, I mentioned nothing says gentrification like the Rockefellers moving in in the late 1870s. And then you have, again, our family and as well as other early Black Greenwich families not only moving out because of gentrification, but because you have white ethnic immigration. Um, you have, I mean, you can go look at the, the 1840, 1850, 1860 census and pages you see of people coming in from Ireland, Scotland, Italy, British, and they basically take the jobs that our ancestor always had which then push us out to the places that you can still find us today. And we may not live in Greenwich, but don't get it twisted. We're still, so many of us are within a half hour. A lot of us are within new, still within New England. And, and many of us have gone across the country, but our roots remain here. And um, we consider ourselves pretty much part of old Greenwich. Again, um, an archivist uh, uh, wrote this up and I underlined, until Twachman bought the property and took up residence in the house, the settlement was 100% black. Twachman's arrival was uh, in the vanguard of gentrification that would remove most of Greenwich's rural, lower and middle income population and all of its black population. Um, from Greenwich and the Greenwich again, we know today of the uber rich, although there are still early Greenwich families represented, um, is, is not the Greenwich of yesterday. And when I went to defend um, my ancestors um, in court, when the town was getting ready to purchase our three cemeteries, I stood up and looked at that wall and on that wall listed the early black, well, early families of Greenwich. I said, when you see Green, Merritt, Lyon, we were here. And I want you to remember, we were here. Um, why is hang root important? Enslaved and free people of color were always an intrinsic part of Greenwich. History 
cannot be told from one side. It has to encompass all sides. And our history is pretty much um, part of it. Uh, we were patriots from the beginning. Uh, they were like everybody else during that time period. Farmers, laborers, stonemasons, Hangroot was also a refuge for self-emancipating people. And we were part of the Underground Railroad. Um, one of the things I'm doing now is, is writing, continue to write on my book that um, is basically discussing the social networks of the early founders, early founders of the Underground Railroad. You know, the people who came before Frederick, Harry and Sojourner, those people on the, the founders um, that over time, people have forgotten about because as abolitionism takes a hold, you find that white abolitionists decided that these mixed race people were not authentic enough, that we had to, uh, you know, replace them to, uh, because they had been freed a couple of generations before that we had, they had to be replaced by people who were just becoming free. So that this early history of, has gotten, has become forgotten. Um, again, let's, let's move into the colored cemetery and then I can open up. So here's a picture. So, um, the, and, and whenever I see this picture, I, I think about how I wrote my blog post, the DNA trail part two from um, Madagascar to Manhattan. And I finished that the night before we had this visit and something that seared on my brain. Because when you read the last paragraph, I'm talking about, although I'm talking about a cemetery in Albany, Schuyler Flats that was excavated and where they found that the enslaved people buried there through uh, mitochondrial DNA analysis found out that they were African, West African, East African, specifically Malagasy descent and Native American. And I talk about how when we discuss Westchester, even in New York City, uh, you got Rip Van Dam Bridge, you got Van Cortland Park, you got Phillipsburg Manor, you got all these places. Um, you, everybody knows about Caleb Heathcott, you know, you have all these names and streets and uh, places uh, named after people who are considered on the vanguard of patriotism, who always were part of the transatlantic slave trade too, who, 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 who uh, uh, you know, sold human beings for profit, how their names are elevated, whereas our ancestors have been forgotten. And as long as, and I promised my ancestors, <laughs> as long as I found them, when I found them, I made a whole lot of promises. And I have to say, I plan, I get emotional. I plan to keep every one of those promises I made to resurrect their lives and their memories. The day, night before I had finished my blog post, we came, we, Pat drove, Pat and her brother Eddie in this picture, we drove up and I kept, my spirit was, I was like, this is so weird to me that I'm here and I just finished this blog post and I'm seeing in prime time what I wrote about. It's so weird. Um, Mrs. Stewart here, you see this bay window? Five feet from that bay window was a little stone wall. We came up and she was the hostess of, with the mostess, picture of benevolence. She gave us a tour and she mentioned wanting to put a plaque on this tree. But every time she wanted to put a plaque on this tree and she wanted to beautify the property, whoops, beautify the property and plant, have plants, let me find, put plants here and plants here, that a person would come. And they came with a cease and desist order and she kept saying that, you know, she just decided not to do anything. Now, I know from the look 
that she gave us sight that it was a look that she had no clue maybe you know it's a look that I often get where people make assumptions based on my last name or how I look and I kept asking her and Pat will tell me like 10 times and I, I have a habit of doing that just to see if I get a different answer and she kept it not answering me she was dodging my questions because the question was um you're telling me you did your research and there was no deed but why are you adhering to a cease and desist that makes no sense to me she wanted she she gave us the talk we go into her house before uh and and i want to talk cemeteries i have my ipad i want to talk about this and she cut me off and said where are you from and i said i parked the car in harvard yard where did you go to school i said bowden college she physically turned her back to me and started talking to pat and eddie that we're, we're eyeing each other the whole time she told me she didn't know anybody in Greenwich as we were leaving I shook her hand one last time and said I don't know why you adhered to a cease and desist because if I did my research because I know how I do my research I I wouldn't have given up so easily and she just looked at me and didn't say anything but she asked me could I appear at a town hall meeting if she needed me so we didn't know what to say and I said yeah and she asked me she didn't know anybody i said oh i got people i know got in that car i'm in the back seat i looked at eddie and pat and i said i'm going to tell you what my nana told me i smell fish and not in a good way pat turned around and said she didn't answer your question you kept asking i'm like i know eddie had eddie eddie was just straight up funny he's like trace i never trust a woman who talks that fast and I, I, you know, they took me to the train station. I walked in here. At the time, my best friend was babysitting my other dog who had cancer. And she said, what's wrong? I said, something's not right. I said, something, I just, something's not right. I'm a professional. I got up the next morning and I um, wrote her at five o'clock in the morning. I said, here's Jeffrey Bingham Mead. Here's Chris Shields of the Greenwich Historical Society archivist. You can call them. They know everything about the Greenwich. I said, here are the photos I took. And, and I got a one sentence email, which was, I look forward to beautifying the property. I called my sister in Houston, woke her up. I think it was only 5 a.m. I'm like, Lisa, why do I feel like someone is scratching a chalkboard? I said, something doesn't seem right. And I worked from home at that time and it was 10 minutes to 10. And I said, oh my God, I forgot to tell Christopher and Jeffrey that I gave their information out. So Jeffrey was in Hawaii then as he is now. And he wrote me back to race and we have to speak in person when I get back. I said, okay, no problem. I'll just let him know, let her know that he's out of town. Christopher sent me an email and said did she tell you the towns in the process of buying all three cemeteries and i was just he's like you need to speak to the the um denise savageo who was the conservation commissioner at the time um i was speechless and it was right after that call that i made the call in um josephine convoy so everything happened right away and then I wrote my first blog post of um, my ancestors are now buried in someone's front lawn. That was in August um, and in September uh, of that year, I believe it was 2016. This is um, Pat and her brother, Eddie. These are two descendants of Charles Merritt, myself, descendant of Georgie e. Green, Alan and George E. Green, Anna, descendant of Sarah Green. And as I said in the chat, we now have Darius Green. And this is um, Chris. I always love this picture because I have, I've been laughing with Chris since day one. Um, and in the background was a list of all the founding families because um, the first time I heard from Chris, I, the first thing she said is, I'm not responsible. Or my ancestors, I'm like, did I say you were? 
no, I did it. And she's like, and I have a potty mouth. I'm like, we're related. I have a potty mouth too. We have not stopped laughing. And the first time we met her, uh, she came bearing gifts and um, I have them on my ancestors table. And I just see that in Chris provided oral history in her court documentation documentation because as a child uh, her mother and her grandmother used to take her not only to the colored cemetery but also to the location where hardy indian was buried which used to be uh, her grandfather's property and they would leave um, flower petals there so her testimony was a direct connection um, on top of all the other. Uh, the stewards filed, I think, like 100 pages or 150 pages. I forget, but I filed double that amount with facts because, again, I don't deal with theories. I deal with facts. Um, this is the Colored Cemetery. Um, this is over here is my cousin Peter with me. Um, this was at the DAR Cemetery ceremony that took place December 18th, Wreaths Across America. This is Pat and her cousin Daryl. And again, um, the ceremony was to honor all veterans. And we figured since there were many lion green merits who fought in the Connecticut Colored Troops that this was appropriate. Um, and uh, this picture uh, is the extended lion green merits all across the color line and we are united i have to point out here a couple of people um keith line is no longer with us bless his soul he was helpful um and to to help it us um we have pam right here pam's story and keith's story are interesting um, they are why DNA matches. This is my cousin Andrea, too. Wait a minute, right over here. Um, Pat and Keith um, are DNA related, but their ancestor uh, were loyalists who ended up. Pam's ancestors actually ended up in Newark, and they ended up in. Um, Upper Canada West at the behest, first in Nova Scotia, but at the behest of uh, John Simcoe, who was one of the first uh, lieutenant governors, governors of Upper Canada West. Uh, he was, although he was an abolitionist, he was anti-Native American, as you can guess, but we're slowly putting the pieces together uh, between our, our, most people don't know that that some of your early settlers of Newark were from Connecticut, hence the Lyon family were, was one of the founding families of Newark. But we're, we're actually beginning to string the Connecticut folks with the New York and the New Jersey with the, the larger story of the Underground Railroad. And that is it for me. I'm going to stop sharing now so I can see everybody and we can open up for questions. I see you, Wanda. <laughs> I see a lot of people. And you're welcome to unmute yourselves and ask any questions out loud. Um, there were a couple things that came in through the chat okay. during your talk. Okay, let me see if I can look. I'll try to get in here. I'm not used to these progressives yet. <laughs> I can, I can, I, okay, I, I ask a question, I can ask you. Okay. So, um, well, I'm kind of interested, like, from, from my perspective, when I'm researching my family, my early American family, how to find records, mm -hmm. and you mentioned records such as, like, the bill of sale, the emancipation record, letter of indenture, and where is the best place to look for those? I okay, so, so first of all, just write this down, because before we, we got on, I, I, I didn't see it on their website. On April 2nd, I will be given a talk and I will, let, I will definitely let you know, Katie, so you can pass it, send it to everybody, um, to the Connecticut Ancestry Society, where I'm going to be talking about caveats of doing research on um, colonial 
Native and African American families, and when I say colonial prior to, let's say prior to 1820. Okay, so when you look for sources, um, the easiest places, it, again, I go, I'm no stone unturned. So again, your historical societies, um, you find, uh, and, and you can go at all levels. So you can go to your local historical society, state libraries, and then go up the truck. Local history uh, sections of your library. They may have books and other records. So I know in Greenwich, the, the Greenwich Public Library has a lot of resources there. Um, places like the Schomburg Library in New York City. The New York Historical Society. Um, a lot of times newspapers. And again, um, it's literally uh, one of the things my cousin Andrea has been doing is um, and looking for our answers, ancestors, whether it be New York, New Jersey, Connecticut, Massachusetts. She goes, she always goes down rabbit trails where, where um, one of the things we do, we have been doing, and I tried to do it in my hang root blog posts is, is follow these early families out. Because again, who are you going to marry, but other people in the same location? So when I, I uh, wrote hang root, resurrect in the community, you can look and see how these families intermarried and where, where they go out. But one of the things you have to be cognizant of is again, formerly newly freed people could not be wards of the town. There are some laws on the book that if you became poor, you were kicked out of the town. So you always, you can't stay in the same location. So if you're only looking for records, let's say in Greenwich of certain people, you're not gonna find them. So you need to broaden your, your search to adjacent towns, to adjacent states, to, because especially people like, I didn't put it here, but you had, um, let me talk about Ichabod Purdy. When he died, people said, oh, he was well known. In the early Greenwich census, He's going under Ichabob Lair. He's going, uh, and then you find out in researching him, well, wait a minute, why is he Lair? Well, it turns out his father, who was born probably 1770s or so, in Phillips, they said Phillipstown, which is around where Phillipstown Manor is, um, his father was a Lair or Alar, A-L-A-R, which sometimes it's spelled A-L-L-A-I-R-E, or Lair. And if you don't do your research and you're looking for Purdy, it, it so happens Ichabod took the name of a former employer, Daniel Purdy. However, that wasn't his birth name. So if you don't follow the trail out, you're gonna come into situations where not only are you not dealing with a surname or you're dealing with surname like Negro, Indian, African, but you have to understand that people, newly freed people might have taken completely new names, not affiliated with any former slaveholder or enslaver, or like my Newark ancestors, that time period right after the, the Revolutionary War, some of the children took the name uh, Thompson. Other people took the name, um, it was Thompson and it was um, O'Fake. You know, so there are different naming conventions. If two people became married and one had one surname from a former enslaver, someone had another one, they might have taken different surnames. So, and then again, you have the case of my fifth great grandmother, grandfather, Samuel Friedman. Okay, so that, is it Friedman, a surname, or was it a formerly enslaved person? Like, I have a cousin on the heady side. Well, her ancestor, he took that his revolutionary war name was John Roland. 
but he took the name John Friedman because he became free. So if you don't do the research and you're looking for John Friedman, when the Revolutionary War pension records are saying, oh, he, we knew him by this name, John Rowland, it's going to be a needle in a haystack. So you have to trace those families out. Not only you, and again, uh, you have to gold mines looking at, we were property. Our ancestors were property. So you need uh, some African Americans and Native Americans hate to say this. They don't want to follow through on the, on finding out any information on former slaveholders, but you have to, in order to find your ancestors, you need to take a microscope, look at not only the, uh, the direct enslaver, but his brother's sisters, his father to find your, so probate records of gold mines. The Freedmen's Bureau, although we associate the Freedmen's Bureau with the South, a lot of times, you'll, the Freedmen's Bureau had bank records. I, I found some of our ancestors had bank accounts in the Freedmen's Bureau for the Civil War. You go back and it's a needle in a haystack. You can go to the early slave census. Many states like Connecticut, New York have um, slave census records under the British. And, you know, so you need to go back and look at that. So we'll be discussing this in my April 2nd talk, but there, there's, the paper trail is out there. You just have to, what I call, dig deep and you will find it. Do not get discouraged. Do not think it doesn't exist. Um, we have plenty of people who have gone way back. I'm thinking of a uh, friend and mentor, Nika Smith, who most of you might know from our, our website. And I will say, um, if you, Two, two things that, and I have it on the handout. If you want to know how to do enslaved ancestor research, you have to go to the experts who do it. I highly recommend you go on YouTube and you look up all the Black Progen um, videos that go state by state, topic by topic. I recommend that you go to uh, Nika Smith's website, who is Nika Smith, become a patron of her website. Um, she has stopped, we, we've, we've done like over a hundred episodes of Black Pro Gen. So though we're still live on YouTube, she has moved over to continuing the format under a tiered pay program under her Patreon. So if you go to her website, who is nikasmith.com, it's in the handout. You can become a patron and, and um, also Nika, my cousin, Shelly Murphy, who's also a member of DAR, Angela Walton Raji, and others are founders of, of um, Maggie, the Midwestern African American Genealogical Institute. That's on your handout. Um, try to attend that. They have a bunch of different every year. This year, I believe it's another virtual uh, conference they're having in June. Check these people out. You got to go with the experts. Go. I have sat in on umpteen numbers of webinars on doing early African-American research, early native, and they always leave out the caveats that we always discuss. So I highly encourage you uh, to, to check out those videos in those formats. Next question. <laughs> I, I can't, I gotta I got I got bring people with me because <laughs> the, the truth is out there. And one of the things I have to say about Nika Smith, on her blog post, she recently uh, gave a talk at Amherst where she was able to trace her Louisiana ancestors, not only back to Africa, but to the founders of Amherst College in Massachusetts. It's and an she, amazing talk. I and, saw it. And so she good. has receipt upon receipt upon receipt. So I don't want to hear that. Yes, it is difficult. We know that it's difficult. But I don't want to hear that it's not possible. It is possible because many of us are out there doing it every day. And my cousin, uh, Muriel Didi um, Roberts, she just got her DAR membership from an ancestor from Plymouth Plantation. It can be done. 
So I, I'm putting out there. I want to give a shout out to my cousin, D Naja Boyd, who is my second cousin. Uh, and again, a Georgie Green descendant. So I wanted to meet your cousin, Naja, <laughs> online and Pat <laughs> and probably others that I can't see. Any other questions? None? No? No other? <laughs> Any other questions? Everybody knows me. I stay until the last question's asked. <laughs> Um, I have a question, Teresa. Okay. Um, in attempting to save your family cemetery, how much help did you get from the city, if any? The, 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 the town has been, it, 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 it was a process. I'm not going to lie. Pat uh, can te testify. It was a process because we didn't know certain things up front. Um, when, when my friend Jeffrey Bigham Mead came back, one of the first things, and you can Google this online. I have, uh, I have links to my, uh, talks, uh, on my blog posts, but, uh, there was an archeological report done. Um, and, and within that report, you could clearly see that when they found, when they stopped because of the desecration of the, the front, you could see that there was um, the carport that they attached, sorry, that they attached to the rock formation, which is considered part of the cemetery, was not attached. So when Jeffrey came back, he's like, I think there's a zoning issue. And we started to question that, but we weren't coming, we, we weren't getting answers. So when I stood up and spoke, and, and there were people after me. We had a lion cousin speak to, directly after me and, and many people on the Conservation Commission like Nancy Dickinson and Ann Young and others. When they spoke, um, when the Stewart's lawyer stood up, he, he made, he stopped the progress and said that there was, you know, something. They waited a year. But see, God don't like ugly because within that year, Amen, amen, goes right there. The Greenwich Preservation Trust advocated for a new cemetery law that explicitly stated that any barriers, be it a fence or a rock formation, is considered part of the cemetery. My, my, my feelings were this. The Stewarts had a case against the town because the town it turned out unbeknownst to us we didn't find this till like a year later like 20 early 2019 the town had given them permission to build the carport and which had this new cemetery law been in process they wouldn't have been able to do that so i kid you not god is good here it is 2017 I'm um, three hours from hopping on a flight, kid you not, to Charlottesville to speak at the University of Virginia on black cemeteries. Jeffrey sends me a picture. The cemetery law went in October 1st. My flight is October 2nd. Amen, amen. Front page is when we found out October 2nd that they filed a lawsuit. OK, you can't tell me God doesn't look out for me because I went, screenshotted that, added it to my presentation, haven't stopped talking about it since. And when we responded to um, the, uh, the town, you know, um, at some point they were acting like um, that we were we weren't on the same page. And I, I'm not going to lie, I had to take them to task in, in, in my cousin's paper, Black Westchester, and in the Greenwich Preservation Trust to tell them to stop this, that everybody knows any cemetery in Connecticut over 100 years is an ancient burial ground. Um, and I think when I said that, uh, they might have blinked that I would, I was, we were all prepared to take them to court again if they didn't stop it. So. Um, since that time, um, you know, we're all on the same page. Um, 
one of the things the Stuart ones was, uh, and we didn't, we we never told them that they couldn't use the, the what do you call it, the right of way. We never said that. We never said we want you to take down your carport. We never even suggested that. We just wanted our cemetery to be respected. Um. So so, yeah. So we're happy now. So everybody's on board. Um. We, we, I worked on the plaque language um, with my cousin Norm and with Ann Young. And um, this spring, we will be having a private uh, family memorial reunion uh, service to honor our ancestors. And we just pray that um, they be allowed to rest in peace, you know, and that, uh, because I want to say this, cemeteries matter, because if you get rid of a cemetery, what think about it? You're getting rid of people's physical presence and testament to their lived their lives. You're getting rid of it. You say, "Oops, it's gone. It's gone." Therefore, they didn't exist. I have a T-shirt which I'm in the process of, of ramping up my store in Etsy, where it says, "Black cemeteries matter. Native cemeteries matter." And people, some people have a problem because I have a black fist. But all around this country, this is happening. This is ha black cemeteries have been built over, desecrated, and and so those of us who are enslaved descendants and those of us who are our allies who are standing up to remember these people who have been forgotten, I say kudos to you. Thank you for being part of the solution. Thank you for standing up and remembering remembering people who should have never been forgotten. And in this political climate, again, I don't deal with theories. I deal with facts. And that's what I think we need to remember. I deal with science, DNA, and I deal with facts. And if you could find source documents, there's no reason why my Samuel Freeman is any less important than our Daniel Lyon. No, there's no reason why Toons, the fact that both Toon and Anthony showed agency to run away, though they both came back because they had family ties, but they ran away. They knew what was out there, but yet they came back because they had family. Their stories matter. And not only that, the Bush descendants and the Bush hall, the, the people who built Little Bethel, all over this country, you have people who mattered, whose lives are important, whose documentation are there. And those of us who seek it out and tell those stories. And I, you know, I was interviewed by Channel 12 and I'm so happy that you have Dennis Culleton's Witness Stones project. I hope they export that project all over the country. It's a great way to get students involved so that they know this history at a young age so they don't become shocked as an adult. Well, this didn't happen because I would have learned about it in school. You know, but if we get them in and we teach these kids young, maybe this country will be for the better. Right. And that's my that's my mantra. That's it. <laughs> Nothing else. Sure okay. that. Are there any other questions? I just want to say people can find me on my my email on my blog. It's in all the handouts. You got everything. Feel free to email me uh, uh, as soon as I um, find out when the Connecticut Ancestry uh, uh, Society has that up. I thought it was up already. Um, I will send it to everybody and and to your and then you can circulate it because we'll be talking more in depth on how to do this type of research. Awesome. Thank you. All right. Okay. Well, thank you so much, Teresa. This was a really great talk and I learned a lot. Awesome. Thank so you. Thank you. Wanda, thank you. Wait, Wanda, I'm gonna call you. This was you. great. I'm gonna call you, Naja. Don't worry, you're gonna be on the I'm gonna be calling you. So I'm I'm glad because I have to say this is the first time both Naja and Wanda are hearing about their ancestors. Oh, so that's while awesome. this is yeah, new to me, okay, they, I'll be waiting for it. your call. All right, I'll call you for Naja. Age before, as my grandfather said, age before beauty. <laughs> you so I'm messing with you, Wanda. Thank you, everybody. I enjoyed presenting with you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, right now, so okay, that's bye -bye. why you can't Take see care. me. I'm in the car. Okay. Bye, All right. Wanda. Okay. <laughs> Take care.
Bye, Bye. everyone. Bye -bye. Thank you so much.